Welcome to Double Standards with me, Afshin Ratansi. So last week it was Europe that took out Press TV. This week the United States Office of Foreign Assets Control tried to shut down other TV channels. Free speech, we investigate. Coming up in the show, we go to one of the most militarized zones on Earth and discover Gangnam style. Our reporter Lester Square tries to talk to the head of the BBC, and after a murky alliance between the EU and private TV satellite companies bans this TV channel, we speak to Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire about the implications of ending free speech in Europe. Australian viewers can watch Double Standards on cable and satellite. This isn't making Prime Minister Julia Gillard happy one bit. Here she is in the Australian Parliament slamming this show. Repulsive double standards. Repulsive double standards. We got our own back against the warmongering Australian leader during her trip to India, digging a little hole beside the Gandhi Memorial. Oh. What does former U.S. President Jimmy Carter think of the U.S. election process then? The best in the world. Except he wasn't talking about America. Let's hear that in full. Of the 92 elections that we've monitored, I would say that the election process in Venezuela is the best in the world. Ah, the election which saw Hugo Chavez win another victory in Venezuela was the one Carter was talking about. What does he have to say about next week's U.S. elections? Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter issued a blistering indictment of the American electoral process Tuesday, saying it is shot through with financial corruption that threatens democracy. In fact, former President Carter said, We have one of the worst election processes in the world, right in the United States of America. And I bet one of the reasons he doesn't like them are stories like these. The Koch brothers have promised to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to defeat President Obama and progressives in this election. But that's not enough. Find out what America's most notorious oligarchs are doing to their employees now to ensure that Mitt Romney wins the White House come November. Yes, the second richest private company in America, Coke Industries, is in the news for not only spending $400 million on election lobbying, but now for sending out a letter to its 45,000 employees telling them to vote Romney or suffer the consequences. Now let's turn to what U.S. presidential contender Mitt Romney said about Iran and Syria. Syria is Iran's only ally in the Arab world. It's their route to the sea. What? Route to the sea? Let's look at this map. Ah yes, Iran only has the Caspian Sea to its north, the Persian Gulf to its west, and the Indian Ocean to its south. Syria doesn't even border Iran, so how can it be a route to any sea? Iraq and Turkey are in the way. UK Journalism News and Jeremy Paxman's boss on Newsnight, Peter Rippon, has disappeared. The BBC said he has stepped aside because of the child abuse scandal that has engulfed the organisation. Here he is being questioned by former senior BBC editor Rod Little. I don't know what stepped aside means entirely. I mean, you might know, he's your uh, I boss. Don't, uh, well, I, 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 I don't know either. And that wasn't the only question Paxman couldn't answer. Here, Conrad Black, the former Canadian media tycoon who used to own the British Daily Telegraph, asked the Newsnight presenter about why all BBC News is written by Mossad and the CIA. How do you explain that? I don't think I have to answer uh, well, that Well, give it a try. Why? You're Criminal. a fool. You're just a gullible fool. You're a priggish, gullible British fool. Well, we've had the US presidential debates, which were organized by Bud Weiser Beer, and one performance that surprised much of the corporate media was that of Vice President Joe Biden. Commentators thought he was brilliant. He joins me now, live from Washington, DC. Hello, Mr. Biden, congratulations on your debate with Paul Ryan. Thank you. Americans have had four years of your economic policies, Mr. Biden. What do you put the closeness of the race down to? To those failed policies that gave us this great recession. Great recession? Why do you think it's great? What do you think will happen if you are re-elected? Another financial meltdown. Your administration has repeatedly violated the values that inspired the United Nations Charter. How do you characterize the difference between the UN and President Obama? 
with fundamentally different visions and a fundamentally different set of values. You get big donations from multinationals. What do they want from you if you get elected? Tax breaks for companies that ship jobs overseas, to tax breaks for oil companies. But haven't you seen the film The Grapes of Wrath about poverty in America? Well, as the president made clear, we have seen this movie before. And we all know how it ended. You're a committed Zionist and have always supported the Israeli lobby group, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. How do you square that with the U.S. Constitution? Will you ever go back and embrace the values of the U.S. Constitution? The president and I are determined, absolutely determined, not to go back to that. Thank you, Vice President Biden. Good luck with your elections. Thank you. Well, this week I've come to one of the most militarized zones in the world, handily called the demilitarized zone, between nuclear-armed North and South Koreas. Apparently there's a debate on in New York between two high-profile Koreans that double standards needs to go and attend. I'm off to the Big Apple. Ah, the Big Apple. Who writes this nonsense? I meant this New York and this United Nations. Secretary General, Secretary General, there are more people here than at General Assembly. Is this the biggest crowd you've ever had? What a big crowd do we have? <laughs> I have never seen this a big crowd. I know you're both South Koreans. Shouldn't this meeting include North Koreans too? So now you have first and second famous Korean in the <laughs> What are you laughing about? Where are the North Koreans? <laughs> Why are you laughing? You're talking about nuclear, US nuclear installations in South Korea. Can you show us how they move? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Looks more like Nam Nam style to me. No progress then on the Korea talks. Great to see the annual red poppy appeal in Britain to commemorate fallen British troops launch on Wednesday. Let's take a look at the president of the Royal British Legion that sponsors it. An undercover operation carried out by the Sunday Times, which revealed the head of the Royal British Legion, Lieutenant General Sir John Keasley, saying he could offer to help firms lobby for arms deals, has a mate announced his immediate resignation of the Royal British Legion in light of the allegations. Ah, oh, it seems the man running the poppy appeal in memory of the war to end all wars was actively trying to earn money from promoting the chances of more war. Let's see him in action talking to reporters from the UK Sunday Times posing as South Korean arms buyers. Look at him name drop the Queen of Britain and UK Defence Secretary and Arms Procurer, Philip Hammond. So I'm terribly glad you're standing there waiting for the Queen. <laughs> Uh, with nothing else to talk about, Philip Hammond, than whatever. Then we're working for this company. And, mm. you know, that is extremely useful for contracts. Someone who could have made a lot of money out of arms contract lobbying is defence expert and comedian David Mulholland, who joins me now to go through some of the cartoons from around the world. Welcome back yeah. to the show, David. Hi, Afshin. Yes, if I would only didn't have a, a conscience and a moral centre, I could have done that. Um, yeah, a couple that, of nuclear missiles? Uh, no, no, never sold arms at all. Just uh, talked about people who did. On this day, in 1971, DRC, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, renamed Zaire as the CIA brought US-backed dictator Mobutu to power. Killed loads of children, just like America's doing in Syria, backing those Salafists that now, shot that Now, I think that that, that is inaccurate. Uh, Field Marshal General President for Life Mobutu Sese Seko, the lover of women, is, to quote his full title, was, was not... He was not prejudiced based on age. He killed people of every age group. And I do disagree with that about Syria. The U.S. is trying to stay out of Syria. But, yes, okay, Let's this next this cartoon, one. it's about Malala Yous Yousafzai. Uh, and it says, uh, what terrifies religious extremists like the Taliban are not American tanks or bombs or bullets. It's a girl with a book. And uh, th the thing is, what, what happened in the, in the Swat Valley in, in Pakistan is this girl was writing a thing about how a uh, campaign to educate girls. And the Taliban didn't like that, so they shot her in the head. Didn't the Americans back the uh, Mujahideen fighters against the Soviet Union that led yeah, to the people in the that 80s, shot her in the head? Yeah, in the 80s, and that was one of the biggest mistakes of U.S. foreign policy and widely considered one of the biggest mistakes one of U.S. foreign policy in many decades. One happy statistic. Of course, Malala is at a hospital here in Birmingham yeah. in Britain. Uh, 1994, U.S. prison population topped one million for the first time. How is U.S. civil society? What films are they watching? What films are they watching? Well, let's uh, look at this next cartoon. Here it says uh, in the cinema, Looper, Cloud Atlas, 
Romney and Ryan's most excellent adventure. And the woman selling the tickets is saying, they're all time travel stories, but only Romney will take you back to the Bush Cheney years. He said he wouldn't take anyone back to the Bush years. He was against Bush, he said in the previous debate. Yeah, well, then why has he got 17 of Bush's 24 foreign policy advisors on his foreign policy team? They've all learned lessons. Obama has murdered way more civilians than George W. Bush has using drones, I'll tell you that. On this day in 1967, the Catholic priest, uh, uh, one of the Baltimore, uh, what's his name? Berrigan. Berrigan. Protests against the Vietnam War poured blood onto U.S. conscription records. That was in 1967. I presume that's why you're choosing this terrifying final cartoon. Yeah, this, fi this final cartoon. Um, and in this final cartoon, you have a Roman centurion with a, a death sigh saying, Help wanted. Like to travel? Looking for enterprising, qualified, inexperienced, harbinger of death, destruction, murder, mayhem, etc. to manage our new operation in Turkey, Syria, and potentially Russia. Please call for interview. Triple six, triple six, hell. What's going on in Syria really has the potential to spin out of control and bring all the countries around it into a war. And we're looking at what could possibly be a regional war in the Middle East. Uh, there's been enough war in the Middle East. And this is one of the things that I think everyone who has any input into this has to start trying to tamp this down. This could spin out of control. Thank you, David Mahon. You're off to uh, Soho to continue your uh, long-running comedy club. Yes, I am. See you next week. See you next week, Catherine. Well, some of our viewers will be watching this on YouTube, others watch it on cable, and some watch it via the umpteen satellites broadcasting this show around the world. But for those of you in Europe trying to get it via satellite, you have a problem. The European Commission has decreed that Europeans must not see this or any other show on this channel. With me to talk about the broadcast ban is Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Welcome back, Patrick. Thanks, Austin. I mean, uh, so, sh so swiftly after winning the Nobel Peace Prize, this is what happens. What are your thoughts? Well, I was kind of shocked because uh, I know that sanctions have been uh, agreed upon by most of Europe and the United States against Iran. And this is an unprecedented extension of sanctions. This is cutting communications effectively. And I think uh, it doesn't take a genius to uh, speculate where this is leading. Obviously, with the past conflicts, military conflicts, the U.S. has had total control of the media, particularly in Iraq, only allowing embedded journalists in, etc. It would be very embarrassing if they were to have a military standoff with, in the future with Iran to have reports coming out on press TV daily of civilian casualties and all these things that we didn't never saw in Iraq. They have had their eyes on press TV, the, uh, the establishment, if you will, has had its eyes on press TV from, and from, from, for a long time, and they're going to take it off the air by hook or crook. In this country, uh, Ofcom has used very spurious allegations against press TV in order to have it removed from Sky, for instance, uh, something that, you know, if you look at some of the other networks, if we were, really want to talk about integrity in media, and who should be pulled off the air. We don't, we don't have to look much farther than, let's say, CNN. Here's a good example. CNN was running fake newscasts out of Syria with a British agent named Danny Dayem. Um, staged kind of newscast with sound effects. It's all there for everyone to see online. And also, CNN has been caught red-handed doing this in... CNN Saudi did admit that they were fake. And, and in Saudi Arabia, in the first Gulf War. Embarrassing. BBC used photographs, misrepresented photographs, I mean, this is blatantly misrepresenting fact um, and creating fiction. And certainly that would be grounds to lose your broadcasting license. Now, also the BBC, interestingly enough, has had an internal cover-up of a rampant, systematic, institutional pedophile problem in, at the BBC and in the entertainment industry. So for, for a public broadcaster <laughs> to shut down an internal investigation in a free country like Britain, wouldn't you think that... Uh, at least people wouldn't want to pay their TV license, I yeah, would many, imagine. Many have commented that if it was a newspaper where a leading person of the newspaper was found to be allowed, in effect, to abuse children for so many years, the newspaper would probably close down. So, you know, the reason I'm saying this is to put it into perspective. Press TV is a, is a media outlet. It's doing good journalism as far as many people and a lot of commentators have really applauded Press TV, especially in places like Syria, where the mainstream media, the corporate Western media's coverage is very skewed towards um, favoring the Free Syrian Army and the Al-Qaeda, Western-funded terrorist sides. 
um, as opposed to the Assad government. Press TV just had its one of its chief bureau correspondents in Damascus. And I'm not very squeamish about saying that I believe that it was a targeted assassination. He's a very well-known face in Damascus. It was a sniper. It was a sniper. And so that's really saying we're shutting down certain media and only allowing other media. So if the public allows press TV to be um, shut down in this way, then the next is Russia Today. They'll shut that down one day. Then the next is going to be the Internet. And then the next is Channel 4 until you have nothing left of maybe one or two media outlets in the whole of, I suppose of the, the neoliberal or liberal argument is the press TV, okay, but it presents the other argument without giving due prominence to other arguments uh, in any given foreign policy situation. Well, this is an interesting point because, you know, we live in a bubble. And a lot of times, until you remove yourself from that bubble, you can't really, you don't even know you're living in a bubble in a kind of an information prison in the West. If you travel to America, you can really see it after living in Britain. And I came out to defend Press TV last year during the Ofcom um, incident, and I, I, I stand by that because you have to, it's the first domino. If you let the first domino go, everything can fall after that. And but so, no one's covering it. And we've got to remember that there are MPs, the former mayor of London, etc., who all work for uh, well, different programs that are on Press TV. <laughs> Press TV is a thorn in the side of the European establishment because it's letting information out from places like Iran, from Syria, from all over the Middle East, from Central America. I've seen press TV reporters all over the world doing great documentaries. And it's, you know that's what media is. You should be able to make content that doesn't fit into a narrow band of public policy coming out of Westminster or coming out of Washington, D.C. And I think Russia Today has excelled, press TV has excelled in those departments. And that's why their ratings are skyrocketing. And if you ban press TV, people will still find a way to watch it online. They will fight to find it on streaming. I can watch television shows out of America. I'm not supposed to watch in Britain through streaming networks. And that's all they're going to do is drive it underground and make it more popular. And it's going to make the information more powerful. And so it could be an own goal by the European Commission. There's another side to this. Another angle is the NAM meeting in Tehran a few months ago looked like, in my eyes and a lot of other pundits' eyes, as a success, an international success. In other words, a competing international meeting where voices and opinions and analysis of, of a paradigm in the geopolitical arena in that region can be discussed without the pre overwhelming pressure of the United States in New York City at the UN overbearing over the Security Council in any debate there. So NAM was successful. Could this latest move be a retaliation? Because obviously there's a wave of awareness that's increasing on the globe. And Press TV and Russia Today, and there's lots of countries that will catch on to the soft power trend and start their own international English language news media to and influence public opinion in places like America, Canada, uh, and the middle class Britain and Europe. And so these, the, you know, the voters in these countries are going to look at their leaders and say, why, are we, why, why do we want to attack Iran militarily? Why? These are, these are people just like us, going about their daily business, want to live normal lives, want their kids to go to school, get married and get a good job, and have nice families. Same as this country and any other country. Thank you, Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Thanks, so. Now it's time for People of Britain. Let's go to our roaming reporter. Time for our special section, People of Britain. Over to you, Lester Square. Yes, Afshin, it's Leicester Square here, and we've got a surprise for you today. I've secured an interview with the Director General of the BBC at his new offices here in central London. We're going to see what all this child necrophilia, all the gambling, everything, whatever the scandal is anyway. I'm going to do it now. Hello? Yes, hello? Yes, I've got an interview with the Director General of the BBC. Well, no, it, it's definitely the right address. I've got it here. Oh, wait, wrong address. Oh. Could it be another number? Hello? Hello, I've got an appointment with the Director General of the BBC. Go away, Lester Square, you crazy reporter. Anyway, it's People of Britain time.
Yeah. The BBC has said that they, they, it stands for Bonking British Children, not British Broadcasting Corporation. What's oh, your view on that's it? That's a bit drastic, isn't it? <laughs> I don't believe that for they a minute. They said the clue is in the name, so they have nothing to apologise for. All right, well, no, I disagree. I think that's wrong. Really? Yeah. But Rupert Murdoch hid a necrophilia scandal up uh, before, and now Jimmy Savile's being accused of that as well. Do you think it's all the BBC's fault or Rupert Murdoch as well? I think Rupert Murdoch. The BBC, uh, they've just said the clue is in the name. It stands for Bonking British Children. What do you think about the BBC, the British Broadcasting? It's cool. Yes, it's yes. good. Yes. Yes. It's, good. Yes. it's really good. Yeah. If James Bond was to run, uh, run against Romney and Obama in the coming US elections, would you vote for him? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Why? Because well, he's British. <laughs> Surely after the MI6 uh, revelations about drones this week? Yeah, but James Bond isn't real, is he? James Bond is thinking of uh, running against Romney and Obama. Do you think you'd vote for him? I'd vote for Canada. Ah. I heard Canada was running against uh, Bush last time and almost won. The entire nation of Canada. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They would have made a great president. James Bond thinking of running against Romney and Obama. Uh, yeah. A good idea? Good, uh, yeah, brilliant idea. BBC defending itself against the allegation, saying that Actually, the clue is in the name. They stand for bonking British children, not British Broadcasting Corporation. Is that really a valid defence? Well, I think the BBC do not have a leg to stand on. I think they're being caught in a bad situation, reflecting there's something deeply wrong with that institution to allow something, what we've seen, to happen for so long. I think action needs to be happened in the BBC. I think people need to resign. And I think they need a clean-cut approach to modernise themselves, to make themselves a relevant broadcaster in Britain again. Oh, no! The BBC is, no. A, it's just a, is a British institution. I'm really cross about that. To bunking. No, who's, who said that? The BBC are defending themselves against all the abuse allegations by saying they stand for yeah. bonking British children. A good, a good defense? Yes. You think? I like. There you have it, I've shown the voices of the people of Britain. It turns out George Entwistle, Director General of the BBC, wasn't in that building earlier after all. He was down here. Yes, down this drain with all the rest of BBC management. So, it looks like next week I'll have to go down to the sewer to meet all of the BBC management. The British bonking company staff. See you next week. Thanks, Lester. See you next week in the sewer for more people of Britain. You can email us at comment at doublestandardstv.com. Well, the US presidential debates are over. Anyone would think that there's a massive difference between Democrats and Republicans. This courtesy of Mark Fiore, you'll have to wait till the end to see the lack of difference between donkeys and elephants. Oh, Mr. Speaker, the socialist, class warfare loving, free market hating, Obamunist president of the United States. All who work to produce should share equitably in the fruits of their labor. Vanishing loopholes and a minimum tax will mean that everybody in every corporation pay their fair share. Government must have a heart as well as a head. There can be no effective control of corporations while their political activity remains. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. We will establish a new system that makes high quality health care available to every American. We have pledged to help our citizens find affordable medical care in the later years of life. These reforms are the act of a vibrant and compassionate government. There can be no greater issue than that of conservation in this country. The price tag on pollution control is high. Uh, the program I shall propose to Congress will be the most comprehensive and costly program in this field in America's history. This requires comprehensive new regulations. The welfare of each of us is dependent fundamentally upon the welfare of all of us. I am glad to know that there is a system of labor where the laborer can strike if he wants to. I wish to God that such a system prevailed all over the world. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, Every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. Let us begin in unity with justice and love. Thank you and God bless.